what a great day one and to make it even better we have an amazing closing keynote ahead naimi is a leader specializing in python and linux and building developer team she is a make it work problem solver with over 15 years of experience and lpi2 certification in managing linux systems naimi has been learning teaching writing about and using python since 2001 an elected fellow of the python software foundation naimi is also a past chair of its board of directors naimi leads a team of python programmers for the click art material naimi we welcome you and the stage is yours now thank you thank you so much uh it's a pleasure to be here um and um yeah i i i want to talk to you today a little bit this will be uh an unusual talk for a pycon i suppose um but there are things that i think i think need to be said sometimes so i guess i'm i'm going to try and say them um this is based a little bit on um a talk i also gave at at europython a few months ago somebody mentioned that on twitter and uh this sort of starts from the same point but i've been thinking about these issues uh, a fair amount for the past 6 months and as i continue to think this is kind of where i'm at now and um it's called inclusion in community in the face of crisis i guess maybe it should have been called resilience inclusion and in community in the face of crisis but that starts to get to be too long a title to fit on a slide um and um you know of course speaking of the slides uh you will see a a bitly link to the slides uh on this page and it's at the bottom of every page so if you want to go look at the slides for what they're worth uh you can do that at at any time So um yeah well let's let's go ahead. So as as mentioned I I used to be chair uh of the PSF and um I stepped aside as of um the end of June this year. Um before that I'd been chair of the PSF for 3 years. I'd been on the board uh for 5 years and that certainly seemed to me that was probably enough and I I also believe that um organizations that are um sort of open and run by uh by volunteers uh like like the PSF but also like I you know a lot of open source software projects uh if they're going to be sustainable they need to actually practice changing leadership and the only way that could happen uh would be if the leader step aside so i do want to say that i i was i was very proud to be a part of the board um here we are at our last in person board meeting for who knows how long uh which occurred in amsterdam uh last november so nearly a year ago and you know it wasn't only that i had been planning to to step aside as as psf chair i i had a lot of plans um uh, about a year ago um of course i was was looking forward to going to pycon us um there are many things that i helped create at pycon us um the the poster session the education summit um, and the sprints intro you know things like that the the charles and the hatchery and all this so i was i was i was looking forward to going there and kind of like a a proud parent or proud grandparent kind of looking on at some of that stuff um and you know i was going to go to pycon latam which was going to be in puerto vallarta mexico it was going to be be a great time i i already had as of um late january i had my plane ticket for pycon spain uh which happens this weekend uh and in fact i guess virtually i will be at pycon spain tomorrow so um i guess in this in this crazy world of of the current current days um it's at least possible that i now can be more or less in two places at one time um i'd even actually just i i i had even uh, done a painting of pi ladies logos that i was going to give to the auction the pi ladies auction at pycon us i i hand painted 45 of those little logos there this is the the top half of the painting uh it's it's hanging behind me right above my head now as i speak maybe someday i will get a chance to actually donate that to someone but to me and to everybody else then 
2020 happened. Uh, and along with it, uh, of course, COVID-19. And um, this had um, a lot of things. I think I was like a lot of people in that uh, late January, early February, I thought, okay, this, this, this is going to be a bit of an inconvenience, but this is going to going to go away. I, you know, I wonder uh, how much inconvenience it will be, whatever. And then as, as we kept on moving through uh, February, it kept looking more and more serious. And I think by, by the late February, I was like, oh, this, this might not be good. Um, and then I was thinking or hoping that at least maybe we would be able to have PyCon US before uh, the, the virus got too bad. Uh, and I kept watching the numbers. I mean, this is the thing with us as programmers, we can write little programs to figure out all sorts of things. I figured out probabilities of infection and things like that. And by the beginning of March, it was like, oh no, this is not going to work. This is going to be much worse than we feared. Uh, and certainly I would say by the end of the first week of March, I pretty much knew that there was no way we were going to have Pike on US or much of any other, um, much of any other PyCons in person. Uh, and um, of course, as as chair of the PSF at the time, this is kind of an awful position to be in because the PSF, the Python Software Foundation, relies on uh, PyCon US profits to fund, you know, something in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 percent of its of its income, its operating expenses. Uh, you know, the, the the grants we were giving, the support for the core development sprints, uh, just you know, keeping the infrastructure of PyPI running, paying our staff, all of those things come from the money from PyCon, and it looked like we were going to have to cancel. And this is one of these things that I don't think people understood at the time. Uh, we waited until late March to cancel PyCon, not because we didn't know we had to cancel. People were tweeting at us, what's wrong with you? Don't you care about your people? Um, but the fact was, if we would have canceled before the local and regional governments of Pittsburgh made it impossible for us to hold the conference, um, we would have owed, we would have lost um, more than half a million dollars, which would have been a serious problem for the Python Software Foundation. We have two years of reserve we could have kept running, but that would have meant uh, that, that we would have taken a big hit on that reserve, which would have potentially, particularly as things are unfolding now, had, had other implications down the road. So we had to wait until the local government declared that we could not hold PyCon. And they were very slow to do that. And in the meantime, we on the board couldn't even say this is what we were doing because if we were to do that, then that could be held against us as saying we, we intended to cancel the conference no matter what, and we would still have been on the hook. So we were there un unable to say anything about it, but we had to wait. Uh, and, and finally then uh, in, in uh, the latter part of March, we, we got that word from, um, from Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania officials, and we closed down officially, uh, and and we were we were finally in the clear uh, to go ahead and and do that. And um, it was, I think, that was probably one of the most stressful months of my life. To be honest, thinking about what this means for uh, the PSF, for the community, for the things that we try to do, as well as just the whole experience of the conference. So for, for so many people uh, having to go away, but you know, I think if that was the worst that 2020 gave us, looking back now, we would be okay. Uh, in fact, of course, as we all know, it got worse. Um, we had outbreaks, you know, outbreaks in Europe, outbreaks in the U.S., uh, and, and then they continued to spread around the world from there. Uh, that led to quarantines, lockdowns, travel bans, um, 
you know, I, I I'm now getting uh, ads from from airlines asking me to 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 fly. Where would I fly? There's no place I can go now without having a quarantine requirement. Um, and you know, if that weren't enough, uh, in um, in Minneapolis in in late May, uh, a, a a policeman uh, killed a black man, and that triggered racial and and social um, protests. Um, throughout the United States, but that seemed to spill out and happen in a lot of other places around the world. Uh, I think, you know, that's not the only thing driving protests around the world either. There, there have been sort of a, a fair amount of, of unrest. So we had all of that stuff that just sort of basically kept piling on. We thought it was bad in March, man. It, it's, it certainly uh, managed to get worse. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of my point. These are hard times. Uh, these are times that that actually work to pull us apart. They make it in some ways, if you look at it, uh, harder to to you know bring our communities together to build our communities. We can't get together in person anymore. There's there are lots of of things that are causing people fear. There are, is is lots of of conflict in the world. All of these things are kind of adding up in many ways to hard times. And yeah, it just gets worse. There are more hard times to come, of course. Um, the virus will get worse. I think we're now starting to head into what looks like a second or third wave uh, here in the U.S. It's not really like we're heading into the second or third wave. We're just continuing the first one, only more so. Um, we have managed to see governments around the world demonstrate a shocking inability to manage this thing uh, correctly. Uh, if you're looking at the, at the U.S. news that came in overnight, uh, you no doubt know that um, we have yet another piece of evidence of that here in the U.S. Um, and um, I, I don't wish anybody ill, but this is what's been going on. Um, and of course, we have now had worldwide um, a million deaths, um, you know, 20 percent of those in the U.S. alone. Uh, it, it's there's there's just a lot of, of, of there's a lot of virus stuff that is is still ahead of us. Um, and, you know, that also has uh, economic considerations. It has economic considerations in general. It has economic considerations for us as a Python community uh, globally and in, in our various countries and regions. Uh, we have always been, well, not always, but for the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years, we have been kind of in a lucky position uh, being, um, being programmers, being coders, understanding technology. Uh, our skills have been increasingly in demand companies have been willing to spend increasing amounts of their budget to um, you know to to attract us as employees uh, that includes not only you know a, 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 a positive trend in salaries but also these companies have been been willing to spend to support our communities and our events to keep us happy uh, so that we would consider working for them and now I think, you know, we're seeing various degrees of recession and depression uh, hitting. And in spite of some misguided optimism, uh, things aren't as bad maybe as they were a few months ago, but the effects of this are going to be with us for, for quite a while. And again, I don't think that we've seen the end of the down part of this yet. I think we will see more companies struggle. That's going to mean that for us as a Python community, as well as other communities and other, other things, you know, wherever, uh, we're going to not have the resources available that we used to. Uh, and of course, on a personal level, I have known, I know a lot of people who have been laid off or have had salary cuts, uh, that sort of thing. So on a personal level, this is going to be very serious for us, 
even though we're relatively privileged being in technology. And then for the greater communities, of course, it, it has been varying degrees of devastating. Um, so, yeah, and I think actually with today's news, the stock market is, is looking like that again, too. I haven't really checked. But that's what I've heard. Um, and this kind of feeds into something else that is, is going on these days, which is this rising tide of, of polarization of, of an us versus them mentality. And along with that feeding off of that, I think we've got um, populist and, and, and well, honestly repressive uh, governments around the world who will be trying to exploit um, everything else, the, the virus and all of the other problems we're having, uh, and, you know, use that along with, you know, sort of the, the rising sort of current of xenophobia. Uh, and, and I think we will see all sorts of, of marginalized groups be demonized, be repressed, have their rights taken away from, um, you know, anything from migrant workers to uh, minorities. Uh, I think there will probably be a religious component. Certainly it will, it will affect uh, women probably in a negative way. Um, the LGBT population, I think pretty much any marginalized group that you can think of is likely to be a target as governments try to exploit uh, this sort of current of, of polarization populism and combine that with the problems caused by, by the current crisis. Uh, it, it it's just has the potential in many, many places to be a very bad scenario. So yeah, these are scenes that we probably will see for a while. And of course, if that weren't enough, um, we have climate change starting to make itself more and more known. And this is everything from weather uh, catastrophes. Um, you know, again, for example, what I see a lot of here in the US, uh, we've run out of letters of the alphabet to name uh, hurricanes and tropical storms in the Atlantic, uh, which has only happened once or twice before. And we're not even at the end of the season yet. Uh, as well as kind of the creeping description we see from uh, from drought and other things, as well as um, various spots around the world uh, suffering from from wildfires like never before. And you know, I'm thinking um, it's the west coast of the U.S. Uh, it's the Amazon in Brazil. Uh, it's Australia. It's many other places that that you know I. I I don't even haven't heard of, but it, it's it's again becoming a an increasing an increasing problem. So, I think even the final bit of bad news I've got for you, and I promise I'm coming towards the end of the bad news, is that uh, even if we get a new normal, and you know there are there are glimmers of hope for vaccines and treatments for the virus, even if we get a new normal. I don't think the new normal is going to be very normal for a while. I think we're looking at years of after effects. Um, there will certainly be reduced travel. Uh, even if we were to cure every one of the virus tomorrow, uh, the, the damage that the airline industry has undergone with layoffs everywhere, with planes being shut down, with the, the losses and money, all of that sort of thing, um, I think it will, even under ideal conditions, take the travel industry years to recover. I think we're looking at years where uh, travel is going to be expensive, it's going to be difficult, and yeah, it, it, there just will be less of it. Uh, similarly, I wish I could tell you when I expected to see uh, large conferences in person. I love going to PyCons. I, I really wish I could say when, but honestly, I think it's going to be it's going to be a while. And I, I, I deliberately leave that vague, but uh, it will probably be longer than, than, than we expect before we have much of anything in the way of conferences. They will be smaller. They may be online uh, or they may be kind of a mixture of both. But 
I think things like, uh, you know, PyCon US was 3,500 people last year. It's going to be a while uh, before we see that. Uh, and, you know, as we move into the new normal, as I've mentioned, and, and sort of try to live in our bubbles, uh, I think as I mentioned, we're going to see fewer resources for a lot of things, including uh, tech communities. And I've already mentioned the the strain that this will will put on the job market. So it is no secret that I am I am quite old. Uh, I uh, am probably older than most of the people listening to this, and um, I can remember. Uh, the times of the 1960s and 1970s when there seemed to be a lot of conflict and a lot of problems in the world. And, you know, I think already we have, we have gone well beyond anything that I can remember from the 60s and 70s. Uh, what this recalls to me more is what I heard from my parents who, um, grew up and came of age in the 1930s and 40s during the Great Depression and World War II. I think that this is going to have similar consequences. And there, you know, this is like consequences. There will be obviously economic consequences. Uh, there will be social consequences that I can't begin to speculate about. Um, educational consequences. There will be all sorts of things. Not, not since the 30s and 40s, I think, has there been an event like this. And I think that this, uh, this event, this, this crisis will have an impact that will, will have a generational impact. We're talking not in terms of recovering in months or years, but probably decades, honestly. And so, yeah, we're all in a position where we are put, where we have to deal with loss of some sort. And for, for some people, this could be um, a loss of friends and loved ones. Um, many others, it will be a loss of employment uh, for virtually all of us, losses of experiences and of doing things that we love and enjoy. For virtually all of us, uh, to some degree, a loss of, of our connections with others. And, and we all have to deal with those things, like it or not. So how, how do we carry on? Uh, how, do we, how do we process these feelings of loss and grief? And, and then how do we move forward? Um, or another way of putting it is how do we find that resilience to keep going and recover? And to be honest, I, I have seen things of, of people I know occasionally on, and, and comments and things like that of people who seem to be struggling to find that resilience. How, how do we do that? Well, there are some things that, that can be done. And this is kind of my synthesis of some things that I've, 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 I've read over the years about this subject of resilience. Uh, for me, having gone through some various changes in my life, this subject of re resilience and carrying on has always, has always been of interest. So um, that's partly why, in fact, I went through all of the bad news in gory detail to get to this point. Um, one thing that it seems is, is important in being able to, to get through a tough situation is being able to acknowledge it. Uh, and, and this um, calls to mind something called the Stockdale Paradox. And um, I'm not really a huge fan of, of war stories and war heroes, but uh, the Stockdale Paradox is named after uh, James Stockdale, who was a Navy pilot for the U.S., who was shot down in the Vietnam War and then spent uh, eight years as a prisoner of war uh, and was, was tortured pretty brutally, uh, but still managed to organize sort of the resistance of the prisoners of war and all of that. And he went through what was arguably one of the, 
one of the more grueling, one of the more uh, horrible uh, experiences uh, of, of a lot of those people. And he got through it. And in fact, there were other people that were shot down with him in a similar situation who did not. And, and after the fact, uh, he was asked, you know, if there was anything that he could identify that, that would explain why some people made it and some people didn't through this horrible, horrible experience. And his answer was, yeah, it was really pretty easy to tell. Uh, the ones who didn't make it were mostly the ones who were unrealistically optimistic. Uh, they would say, oh, yeah, we're going to be home by Christmas. Uh, and then Christmas would come and they were still there. And then say, oh, well, well, we'll be home by Easter. And then Easter would come and they would still be there. And so it would go. And that, that eventually broke their spirit. So the first thing that you need to do in order to get through a crisis is to understand thoroughly what you're up against and to be aware of, you know, not to have false optimism, I should say, to be aware that things are not just going to magically get better. Uh, and, and that's the situation we face as well. We're not going to be out of this by Christmas. Uh, so we need to be aware of that. But the flip side of this, and that's why they call it the Stockdale paradox, uh, is that you need to also have the faith, the optimism, and even, even the certainty that you're going to be able to find a way to handle this, that you will get through it. Or uh, I think going along with this is this quote from Chomsky that I like, uh, optimism is a strategy for making a better future, because unless you believe that the future can be better, you're unlikely to step up and take responsibility for making it so. So that's that's kind of the, the thing. We, we need to acknowledge that we're in a tough situation and it's going to be a while before things materially get better. Uh, but we need to have that faith, that confidence, that optimism that things will get better and act to make that happen. And that's hard. Because I think at this point, everybody who's listening to me has at some point in the past few months uh, felt, you know, been afraid, been exhausted, hopeless, felt grief for the things that have been lost. Some combination of those at some point, I think we have all, we have all felt. So we need to, we need to think about what it is that can help us get past that and deal with that and act to, to go ahead and keep building. Uh, the future outcome. And in fact, there are, I think, three things. I mean, you could you can split it up, you can make more, you can make fewer, whatever. This is kind of my categorization of three things that, that we can look to uh, to help us through this. And the good news is that so many of us are already doing these things. They're not things that we cannot do. And, and these things then are uh, around sort of three things. One of them is a sense of belonging. And research on resilience say that if you have social connections, this does make you more resilient. Uh, and so here we are in the face of an event that, that pulls us apart. We need to work, perhaps we need to work more intentionally to maintain our social connections. But in fact, we are uh, as, as a Python community, as individuals, we are finding ways to maintain those social connections. Certainly, I check in on friends that I've met from various Python events uh, and see how, you know, how are you doing? Are you okay? Uh, more than I would have before. But also, we've got more events. So like here, uh, this slide, this is um, a, a social meeting that Pi Ladies in El Alto, Bolivia had uh, six weeks ago. Uh, we had just uh, seen a demonstration from Lupe of the Moranada, a, 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 a Bolivian uh, dance. Uh, and, and it was just a, a chance to connect and to make those social connections. Uh, and, you know, honestly, for me, in the before time, I wouldn't probably have had the chance to, to go to a meeting of Pi Ladies Bolivia. But at under these conditions, I could. Uh, I encourage everybody, we all need to look for those chances and sort of seize upon that. And of course, 
meeting meetups and conferences like that online are thriving everywhere. That was not a, like an unusual one-off thing. Um, from everywhere, people are moving meetups and conferences online. Um, you know, here, PyCon India. Um, it looks to be uh, a, a massive conference online. Um, great evidence that this is working. And it is actually, um, in a way, it, it's liberating our current conditions in that when everybody has to be online, then both the organizers and the speakers can go wherever in the world they want. Uh, and and that that I think is is a cool thing. As I say, I, I get to uh, be uh, at PyCon India here today and at um, PyCon Spain tomorrow uh, without ever leaving my house. Actually, I'm ready to leave my house, but that's a different story. Uh, so and and you know, as we do this, we're actually sort of probing and experimenting with all of these tools and techniques. Um, so I think in the in the many uh, meetup and, and conference appearances I've had in the past six months, I think I've had a chance to try out nearly every conferencing tool out there. Uh, we're really sort of working through and doing what we can to make this work. And, you know, in addition, and this is something that I have mentioned uh, in other contexts as well, uh, there is uh, a need, we all have a need for a sense of purpose. Uh, we all like to be able to make meaningful contributions. This is what drives the open source world. This is what drives the Python community. We would not have those things without this desire on all of our parts. Uh, we want to be able to help out uh, to make a contribution. And Again, people who've looked at the subject of resilience and getting through crises say that this is a key, key factor in making it through. And we are doing that also as a Python community, as individuals. Uh, we have had, uh, at least as far as I can tell, a, uh, an explosion of people offering training of one kind or another online. Uh, there are tons of Twitch streams. Uh, I know I did a Twitch stream on Python fundamentals a while back uh, at the beginning of, of quarantine. There are people doing online workshops. There are tons of videos out. Uh, everybody is, is trying to, to contribute in that way, to do what they can. Uh, here, my, my example here is Chuck Ting Ho's uh, Twitch stream. Uh, I, I just chose it. Uh, because she's been so busy in doing all of these things. She's got Python classes. She's got data classes uh, with her friend Laish. She's got a, a video, uh, an, a, an interview show. Uh, there's this, this feeling that we can contribute by helping other people learn that I don't recall seeing before. And it, it truly is a, a, a wonderful thing to see. And then we also have... Um, we also benefit from having, I call it a sense of responsibility. Uh, it's some people call it a sense of obligation. Some people call it a sense of altruism. Uh, this feeling that we need to help others in our community. This is one of the keys towards groups making it through a crisis is this willingness to put aside differences to help those people who need it most and to leave no one behind. Uh, and uh, I see this in a lot of ways. Uh, I see a lot of people who are contributing and trying to do this uh, through things that they can do with code, which of course makes sense because code is what we know, right? Uh, and they're doing data analysis or teaching people how to do data analysis, or they're setting up sites to share data. Um, in fact, one of the best sources for data on the virus in Brazil is a site that is run by people in the Python, com in the Python community in Brazil. And we're also writing applications. This one is, is one that I like a lot. This is ayudapy.org, which is in Paraguay, uh, and it was created by a member of the Python community there on his own. Uh, and it's a way to match up people who need help. They need some sort of specific support with people in their area 
that can give them that support. And we're talking about things that are really basic, like food, diapers, medicine, uh, eggs, milk, sugar, things like that. Uh, and they use uh, the, the this app actually lets people connect by way of WhatsApp so that they can uh, find each other and make the exchange without having a lot of other things there. And you can see on the map where the requests are coming from and, and all of that. It's just like, a, 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 a very cool idea, but the, the thing is, this was somebody stepping in to help the community because that was what he felt he needed to do. So all of this that I've been talking about, of course, is just another way of saying, what is it that helps people get through crisis? It's community. That's, that's what I have been describing. I have been describing uh, the Python community communities in general. And for this to work, what I'm talking about is community in the fullest sense. Uh, the most we can get from connections and contributions, from putting aside our difference, uh, the most we can do in helping those who need it most and in leaving no one behind. And this is where I get to the inclusion part. You may have seen, I'm sort of sneaking around to this. Um, when we think of connections and contributing and all of those things, uh, we need to think of everyone's connections and contributions. I can tell you social connections are even more important for those who are, are marginalized. And, and the, you know, the support of being part of a community is, is important for everybody. Uh, but I could also tell you that the people who have been sort of, who have lived, who have dealt with being in marginalized groups, whether that's uh, migrants or, or um, by gender or whatever, tend to have um, insights and strengths and abilities to contribute in a crisis that are useful. Uh, a um, Susan Stryker, who is a researcher in transgender history, uh, said not long ago that there is an amazing um, wisdom and strength that comes from knowing just how badly the world can crap all over you. Uh, and I think that's true, actually. Uh, so, you know, it is to the benefit of the community to keep that in mind and to make sure that we bring everybody in as we get through this. Uh, the same thing um, in terms of putting aside differences, this, this seems obvious to me, but obviously it's not not always clear to everybody. The more people we can get with the more different experiences to pull together, it's the better we're likely to be. And, you know, if we really do want to help those who need it most, if that is part of our, our spirit of altruism and obligation, it is clearly people in marginalized groups who have been and will continue to be hit the hardest. Um, women and minor minorities always lose their jobs first in a crisis. Uh, and it's groups like that that also tend to have the fewest resources to rely on. By bringing them into our communities, we can help them. Uh, and that is, is part of this altruistic responsibility. And again, this is just kind of to sum it up. If we if we believe in leaving no one behind, that means leave no one behind. So that that brings me to this. Why why am I saying this? And that's because again, as I alluded to earlier on, I think we will find that there are people who are saying this is a crisis. We can worry about inclusion later, or they can even use the crisis to make things worse as an excuse for that. And that is not the right answer. It is not the right answer for anybody. It's not the right answer for a community. Now is, in fact, a good time to act on the subject of, of inclusion and diversity and things like that. And, and that's why I was I was so happy to see that, that here at PyCon India, uh, there is a diversity and inclusion track. Uh, well done. And, um, you know, I, I expect that uh, as you continue doing this, you will find, uh, you will maybe find more aspects to think about and to include in the future, but starting out with, with the focus on gender as you have it is, is fine. And as I say, um, 
making the decision to have a, a diversity and inclusion track in, in, in this year of crisis uh, speaks well of you. So again, well done for that. So I know that, that it is likely that, that people will want to ask, ah, oh, so what do you recommend we do? Uh, and this is not because I know anything. It's just people always ask things like that. And I can't, I can't really answer that for everybody. Um, every community, every person has to, in a way, uh, answer that for themselves. What I will say is that you should do what you can. Okay. And I have, I have a few thoughts on that, but you know, there are other things too. So one thing that I hope we continue to do, because as I say, we have been doing it, is we continue to discover ways to use our technology more fully to support our communities in every way. Um, you know, it's interesting. We've been able to do things like have a conference online. We've been able to do that for a few years. Uh, and but we've never really had a reason to, to try it and to figure it out and get the most that we can. Now we are, now we're trying everything out. And I think that's, that's great. We can, we can take what we have learned and use it in some ways to grow our communities. Uh, technology is for us as, as a Python community, technology is our superpower. Uh, and it's important for us to, to figure out how to use it to, to care for the community, to uh, maintain and build our connections. Uh, we need to do that. Uh, we certainly should continue to do the things we have done to contribute. Uh, the education stuff, it's, it's, I, I, it's great that we do that. We, we need to keep on doing that. Uh, I think particularly as we go through uh, the COVID crisis, there will be negative impacts on education at all levels. If we can do things that help alleviate that in any way, I think that is, is definitely to the good. And if we can manage to share data, and I think we've seen in more than one case, governments have not been entirely honest with their data. Uh, if we can manage to share data and make sure that people are informed, I think that is useful. And of course, if we can uh, create more services, more ways to help people connect to the resources that they need and provide even ways for people to communicate, those are all things that as a Python community, a community of Python programmers worldwide, we can think about doing. Um, and again, clearly, obviously, we can uh, take care of each other. Um, and again, restating, we can we can help those who need it most. We can, as a as a global community of Pythonistas, we can put aside our differences and make sure that we take care of everyone. And finally, let's let's not leave this out. Uh, we can. We can lead. Um, we have the resources to be informed citizens. We can be advocates for community. We can be positive examples. We know what community is like, what it can mean. We can help show others that as well. So I, I, I want us to not back away from any chance we may have in that regard to lead. And where I've been going, we can build, we can keep building our community. We do not have to let this stop us or slow us down as we work to build community. We can continue to organize and volunteer. We can continue to work to bring people in. We can continue to work to figure out how to do things better. We can, and I'm sure we will do all of those things to make sure that our communities continue to grow. So, yeah, I, I know this was, was an unusual talk, but these times, these times will, will reshape the world. I think that that is, is hard to argue about. And again, we in the global Python community, we know the value of community. We know how to make community. 
It is up to us to step up and shape the world that will come. And there's one more thing that I think needs to be said, and I've been saying it at, at the close of every time I've given these talks. So please take this in the spirit it's intended. Wear the damn masks, okay? I don't want to lose a single one of you. So that's what I've got for you. Thank you very much for having me here in PyCon India. It's been an honor and a privilege. Bye-bye.